movie absolutely falls into the best of the best of the classics of that genre status. It can sit in a pile with coffee. It can sit in a pile with Navajo Joe. It can sit in a pile with They Call Her One Eye. It can sit in a pile with Rolling Thunder. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, Death Rides a Horse. Yeah, there's spaghetti Western versions. Some other uh, uh, kung fu things of it. Um, now, having said all those movies I just mentioned, one-armed executioner is definitely the least of them. <laughs> it's definitely on the bottom of that pile of, of movies I just listed. But at the same time, it's a really, really strong entry. And to give it a, even a bit of a more of a hat tip, when it comes to pace, its pace is so strong and is so moves so fast that really only Coffee and Navajo Joe can compete with it when it comes to pace. Yeah, it is constantly, it's a freight train. And it's constantly doing audience pleasing. I don't want to call them tropes, but like mm -hmm. standards. No, no, no. Well, they standards. are no. They, it absolutely the tropes is the exact word. Yeah. All right, because we've seen the story a zillion times. I just before. don't want to call them tropes because that does that makes it sound bad. When in the case of this movie in particular, well, no, it, which it, <laughs> it's how lovingly the tropes are done. Exactly. All right. Exactly. That makes it so enjoyable. How seriously they're taken. And the pace of the film, really, you know, from the moment that the movie starts. It's like greyhounds running across a track the way it gets to its conclusion. But what Roger just said is actually kind of important because one of the things about the movie, it knows what it is. It's a, it's a revenge-o-matic, and it does go through the paces. It goes through the tropes that you've seen many, 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 many times before. But it's so charming mm -hmm. in the way it does it. It's so charming the way it recreates or it almost reinvents these pieces. Now, I will preface this episode on uh, One Arm Executioner with uh, the caveat that we will be using spoilers. I don't even like to use that word, all right? But we will be talking about the film and all of its plot machinations. It's funny, because if you'd asked me when the show started, would I be worrying about spoilers? I'd be like, we're talking about movies that are 40 years old, 50 years old. If they haven't seen them by now, fuck them. But the reality is, is when we watch them, we do see... Certain things were, oh, no, this could be a surprise. If you didn't know that this was going to happen, this would actually and, change your view of the film. And frequently, like the movies you're showing, you may have seen them, but I haven't seen them yeah. sometimes. And so they're a surprise to me. Yeah. And so it's so like, it'd be really special if it was a surprise. Um, yeah. So we so we it. so we play it by ear, but we kind of err towards the idea that, oh, it, at the end of the day, even though we're not even recommending movies, we're just talking about them. You know, but if your viewing of it would be better if you, had, you know, uh, without knowing this piece of plot information well then you know we err towards that way on the other hand i also feel that when it comes to certain subgenres, the, the the mechanics of them are so dyed in the wool that it, it, it's ridiculous not to talk about the, the different tropes the uh, familiar beats the familiar always hit the familiar beats and how they did in them all right you know, if we're talking about a Jaws ripoff, well, guess what? There's going to be some town. There's going to be some naturalistic monster that's in that there's town. Gonna, there's going to be children in the water. Yeah, there will probably be uh, some sort of authority figure there who's responsible for it and somebody who's an authority on the given monster. And then at the end, they're going to fucking kill it <laughs> after it's eaten a whole bunch of people along the way. <laughs> Now, how they ended up killing it in it, okay, am I really spoiling it for you right, <laughs> to say that they kill the monster? But how they did it compared to uh, how all the other Jaws ripoffs did it could be of interest. And to me, that's kind of how I come from the revenge o genre. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read the back of the box, which again, this is a Paragon home video box, so don't expect much when it comes to the back, <laughs> back of it. I'm going to probably have to explain. Although I have to say that from the front of the box... I was ready to see the movie. Oh, the, the, front post, of the, the poster is awesome. But actually, almost all the shit that happens on the box happens in the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the one-arm executioner looks amazing in it. <clears throat> okay, so one-arm executioner. Big subtitle, Revenge is Sweet. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. His wife brutally murdered before his eyes. His arm chopped off as a warning. His job, his pride, his confidence are gone. A young Interpol agent's rage for life has but one meaning. Revenge! Revenge! And revenge! 
<laughs> Running time, approximately 90 minutes. <laughs> Again, like, like, like the Paragon, approximately 90 yeah. minutes. It's not like we have the technology to tell you exactly how long it is. Hey, Jimmy, it how has... long is one-armed executioner? That's approximately an hour and a half. <laughs> okay, put that down. Just put it down. <laughs> you got to get those tapes out. <laughs> Franco Guerrero, who's the star of the film, who's an action star in uh, the Philippines. Franco Guerrero plays an uh, Interpol agent named Ortega. And part of the thing about Ortega is uh, he's trying to shut down uh, this drug dealer named Edwards, played by a guy named, a uh, very interesting guy. One of those, it's one of those weird cheap movie performances where first you think the guy's not very good, but then the more you watch it, the more, he is a little awkward, but then the more you get used to him, the more you kind of like him until finally, no, you actually, I kind of dig the guy's performance. Oh, you mean Nigel Hogg. Yeah, N- Nigel Hogg. N- Nigel no, no. Hogg. And actually the credits are super sketchy on this film. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it took me a while to figure out, okay, who was that guy? Because he had my favorite line uh-huh. in the movie as a drug kingpin, uh-huh. which was, quote, Everybody wants to be the king of shit hill, but it ain't that easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Everybody wants to be the king of shit hill, but it ain't that easy. That was the moment I was like, okay, that's my character. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the guy I love. Well, Nigel was... Hogue, okay, Edwards, he's a pretty terrific bad guy. First, you kind of think he's fat, but then you see him walking around in these Speedos, and you're really like, oh, no, he's not fat at all. He's got like a kind of like what would be like somebody else's head. Well, he's got a fat head. Yeah, a fat head. He's got a fat head, and he's got a fat neck. And then he pulls neck. it back, and he's kind of ripped. I'm he, like, he's, dude, Almost, he's got better abs than I do. He's almost <laughs> ripped. He's one of those almost ripped white guys. Yeah. Like a bear of a... And he has kind of an Elvis almost kind of quality, like a CD. Well, g- you compared him perfectly to Joe Namath. Was yeah, it yeah. Jo- was it Joe yeah, Namath? I said, I said, well, he does look a little bit like Joe Namath. Like like Joe Namath's like sleazy older brother. We call him Ernie Namath. Yeah, Ernie right. Namath. Uh, but I mean, but who he really looks like, to tell you the truth, is he really looks like the missing Mitchum kid. Yeah, because he actually yeah. looks a bit like... Yeah, Robert with that chin and the kind yeah, of nose. The, exactly. So the, the lips that are kind of overly curled. Yeah, so there's Christopher Mitchum, and then there's uh, Jim Mitchum. Yeah. And he really looks like the middle brother yeah, kinda, between the two Mitchums. Kind of has a nasty Mitchum mouth. Yeah, Nigel Mitchum. Yeah, Nigel Mitchum. <laughs> Nigel Mitchum, but that's a weird name. <laughs> That's a cool name. I'm going to write that down. Oh, that's a good name. Nigel Mitchum. Okay, if you see a movie with Nigel Mitchum, you'll know where yeah, I got it This is where it happened. This is this very this is moment. the origin. The Big Bang right here. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. In an embryo. The right. Nigel Mitchum character was born. The Nigel Mitchum. Perhaps the most famous character in cinema history. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like he was a, like a sheep. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's like you were fucking a sheep. <laughs> one of the sheep. One of, one of the sheep from Rage, actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Bleeding out of my nose. <laughs> Slobbering all over. Just drooling. But, um... So Ortega is uh, dealing with his boss, who's actually played by Leopoldo uh, Scolido, who is actually one of the, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he's one of the, uh, uh, in the late 60s, was, uh, along with Fernando Poe, was one of the big stars of Filipino cinema. He, uh, is, uh, probably his most famous movie is, uh, at least for Westerner audiences, is the war movie Raider, The Raiders of Letty Gulf, which is uh, directed by Eddie Romero. And he's the, he's the boss in this, and it, and it's cool because it's like he's you know very realistic. He's a very realistic guy, but with his like weird kind of clothing, his giant collars, and like they're about well, to go no, out it's and, really they're no, about to go out to a nightclub and do karaoke or something. I know it's real. It's it's really interesting what passes as professional wardrobe <laughs> uh, for the Interpol of the Philippines. I bet that's real in the Philippines. No, no, I'm not making fun in of 1981. Them. <laughs> no, I'm I'm not saying it's ridiculous as far as like the movie production, but it, uh, yeah, they all look like they're going out to barbecues or <laughs> or ha- go, getting ready to hit the hit yachts or you go in a nightclub or a bender or a drug bender they or are something dressed very well it's like full-on like saturday night fever yeah yeah exactly <laughs> like flowered shirts and like great cool uh, uh leisure suits yeah. with big wide open collars yeah, what happened to fashion? nobody wears dark colors everything is like white or light or teal you know <laughs> <laughs> so uh Edwards is the big drug dealer, and so Ortega's like, hey, look, let's quit pussyfooting around with these guys. Let's go there, let's, let's shake them up, and let's tell them that we're onto them. So they go and they do a big, they, they can't really bust the guy, really, but they just go to, to roust him, just shake him up. And it does shake up Edwards up. And Edwards says, okay, so we'll, here's what we got to do. We got to hide this, and we got to hide that. But the number one thing we got to do is we got to make an example of that guy, Ortega, to teach overzealous Interpol, Interpol agents a lesson. Yeah. 
of what can happen when you get too nosy. And there's a really nice kind of setup before this where yeah, you're right. his boss kind of runs a restaurant. Is, does no, he, no, it's not his boss. Well, but you're right, though. But he's like but, another guy who was like an well, Interpol I'll tell you exactly, guy I'll tell you exactly whose what it wife is. was like... He's his mentor. Yeah, he's his mentor. And, he's his, his and mentor. that guy's wife, because he was in Interpol, with all the trappings of being a cop, mm -hmm. and his wife pulled him away from being it. She, We're talking about the mentor character. The mentor character. Yeah. And it's almost and, like he's who uh, Ramon Ortega, you know, could, could, be. Be, could be if he were to get married to Anne, his... Uh, yeah. Um, or, or maybe he's already married to Anne. Yeah, he's already married. But the situation is, is like this mentor character was a legend in his own time, kind of Interpol agent. His wife said, look, that's it. If you want to stay with me, I don't want to be worried all the time. You got to quit. So he quits. Because it's the kind of job you do it until you die. Yeah, yeah. And he, and he quits, but he opens up a big bar, big nightclub, nightclub bar. That all the Interpol agents hang out at. That all the Interpol agents <laughs> hang out at. No, it's just like the old movie where the cop quits being a cop, and he opens a cop bar yeah. and all the cops hang out. So Ortega's marrying this white blonde girl named Anne, played by Jodie Kay, who's really charming in the film. She's great. And so they've just come back from America, where uh, Ortega met her parents. In and, San Francisco. In San Francisco. And now they've just come back to uh, Manila. And, and, and she's like, oh, no, I'm just, look, I had a great time, uh, Ramon meeting my parents, and I had a great time seeing them again. But I'm just so happy to be back in Manila. Yeah. And, um, and then the, the mentor character says something like, Yes, you know, my wife wanted me to retire and uh, from the force, and I did. And now she's passed on, and I think what it would have happened if I had stayed. But then I look around at this wonderful club, and I go, hey, this life isn't so bad. What am I worrying about? It's a great moment. It's a really good moment. It's a really wonderful performance that guy yeah, gives. Yeah, that guy's giving He gets a terrific performance all the way through the whole film. And I, I don't have his name. So then uh, Ortega goes to the bathroom during this time. And so he starts talking to Anne and he's like, so really, are you going to be okay with Ramon you know, continuing to be an Interpol agent? And Anne is like, well, what am I going to do? It's, it's like, that's who he is. Yeah, you know? he is, uh, he is. I can't stop him. I can't stop him from doing that. And I don't want to stop him from doing that. And I want to stop him from being who he is. I, the, to take that away from him would be to take away his life. And, and, she stands by her man and who he is. And Jody Kay, the woman who's playing it, she's not much of an actress, but you like her. She's a cool character and she's a cool person playing the character. In fact, there was a point in the movie, and I think it was a memory that happens later on when mm -hmm. they're together on the beach and, yeah, yeah. and he's remembering back. And I was watching it and I think I turned to you and I said... They are a real couple because the yeah, yeah, love yeah. that I'm feeling on screen feels real. It feels like they just took a camera out to Big Sur or something and shot a whole bunch of scenes or uh, probably. Well, you things. actually asked me during the thing. On the, you go, are, are they actually married in real life? And I don't know the answer to that. But I it mean, felt uh, real. It felt real. At enough. the very least, it sounds like they might have had an affair when and, they were making the movie. And <laughs> that is that is the only thing necessary. Like you could have had a million other maybe better actresses mm -hmm. in that role. But what that actress did, what Jodie Kay did, was it actually made me feel the love between them. And, but you so, know, that, so that when the ultimate tragedy comes, mm -hmm. it hurt. Well, and it here, hurt bad. Well, here's the thing about that, though. Yes, everything you just said is true. But you said that from her very first scene. Oh, yeah. You just liked her. You just liked her there right was from the beginning. Well, <laughs> one, it was that she stands by him. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she's just absolutely head over heels, in love with him, does not want to change him, wants him to be him. And like you said, the two actors are sexy together. It's both romantic and sexy. And, and I think a... the reason I felt that from the beginning was mm -hmm. partly the way that she was looking at him in those early restaurant scenes. Like yeah, She yeah, was uh -huh. just looking at him like adoringly, mm -hmm. even. And I found him to be completely attractive in a kind of William Peterson way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James that, that, Con that's what, you, kind that's of what you said, yeah, exactly. I was looking yeah. at him, I was like, it just reminded me of that kind of, uh, mm -hmm. the way that he had the sort of, uh, I don't know what kind of, what you call that jacket, the, uh, that's kind of cut off. Well, the, I love, look, I love- He's got all that William Peterson clothing from like To Live and Die in L.A. Yeah, well, I love <laughs> his- uh, his color what? choices of, of, of red and black. Yeah, he's way, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> right from the very beginning, he's always like juggling these cool outfits that are like red and black, and, like a, re a red sweater with a black leather jacket on top of it. Well, he's wearing all those kind of like tight red and black clothes in the beginning, yeah. and then he loses his arm, mm -hmm. and he's got to walk around for the rest of the movie and convince you that he's lost his arm. Yeah, yeah. 
And by the way, he's doing, you know, all sorts of Kung Fu and he's mm. jumping from, you mm-hmm. know, tall buildings like on, or he's jumping from like, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, the, a rooftop under the ground with his uh-huh. arm tied behind his back yeah, underneath yeah. his clothes uh-huh. and he's pulling it off. Oh, he completely It's convincing. It I mean, it is absolutely convincing. No, you're right. Actually, he wears a bunch of different kind of long, almost like safari outfits, yeah. you know, for a while. But, but, but there actually is a point that when he actually goes back to his red and black on Psalm, it's like he's found himself again. Yeah. Now he's Inspector Ortega again. The color of blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, Edwards uh, sends a bunch of guys over, including this one guy, uh, Jason, played by this fat pig named Peter Cooper. <laughs> oh my God, that guy <laughs> delivers. Bear that. of a man. Yeah. All right. The John Mullius character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then they, they, John, who is a lovely, kind gentleman. Yes, exactly. Compared yeah. to this dude. Let me just rephrase that. Okay. It's not so much that he is the John Malias type, but I can imagine John Malias writing this character. Oh, right? completely. Yeah. The Jason character is definitely a John Malias esque esque character. Yeah. Miliasian? Miliasian? Malias esque. <laughs> there you go. Malias esque. Um, so these bastards uh, show up at the house. And they uh, 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 tie everybody, uh, tie everybody up, gag everybody, cut the wife up for a little bit, torture her, shove a samurai sword into her heart in front of him, and has he scream? No, oh! God! That, and and may I just say yeah. that scene was so well and competently handled because yeah. the, just the going back and forth, you know, first from these kind of mm-hmm. brutal wide shots and getting closer and closer into those extreme close-ups to the point where mm-hmm. he runs her through yeah. with the sword and that crazy close-up of Franco Guerrero as he screams yeah. and goes into camera. And I just, I felt my skin curdle in that moment. And then it, it was so intense. And then like, I mean, look, I've seen that scene a zillion times before. And so you have, have I. And you so have, have I. And you have, and you have, and you have too. That's I why look. I was unprepared for it to be effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think where it actually takes a turn, where it's not just the same old scene that we've seen before, just setting up the plot, that takes it even more into like a, a Straw Dogs, Peckinpah-esque, level is after they kill Anne, it's that guy Jason's laughter yeah. that kind of goes on for almost a minute yeah. as it goes on, as it has this like really well done montage about, you know, this guy's life crumbling as this laughter is like amplified, like yeah. for, Great seeming, sound design. for seemingly in a minute, that's where it gets Peckinpah esque. Yeah. And the pace de resistance is to uh, uh, cut off Inspector Ortega's arm. To cut off his left arm and, uh, and, and until he could kill him, but no, 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 just like they say in, in Brian De Palma's wise guys. We could kill them, but if we do that, what have they learned? <laughs> 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 so they're kind of taking a wise guy attitude. Uh, we could kill Detective Ortega, well, but then, you know, he hasn't learned anything if it's we even, kill him. <laughs> it's even more than that. They call a doctor. They call some lame doctor to cauterize yeah. the wound and dump him at a hospital. Yeah, exactly. And so they've they've patched him up enough that he's not going to bleed to death. Yeah. And they throw him at the front door of a hospital. See? So every day for the rest of his life, he'll know he should not have fucked with Edwards. Exactly. And he has that moment where he wakes up and he's not sure if it's all real. Oh, that's a really good scene. He reaches over and he feels that his arm isn't there. And that's when he realizes that Anne isn't there either because yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. real. And uh-huh. then he has the same scream. And it's so painful. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's literally done. Like tough guys don't dance style. No, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and by, like other people make fun of that. We don't make fun of uh, Ryan no, O'Neill and tough guys a, don't that's dance. That's a real emotion people have. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but re- it, it doesn't have a like. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're literally describing a movie. You probably feel, except for the uh, <laughs> arm cut off part, that you probably feel you've seen done a zillion times before, and you have, but. This production just like it's it's heart and it's Keones are right in the right right place, and Bobby Suarez is a, is a really effective filmmaker. There is uh, there's fantastic shots in this film. Uh, it has a great rhythm and a great energy. Uh, there's there's good lighting. It's it, you know it falls into the same kind of category that we've talked about on some of these movies that works pretty good where. One, this actually, for a Filipino movie, actually has a pretty decent budget. 
I think Franco Guerrero is actually a big enough star there that this was like a. It does everything that a big Hollywood movie would do. They've got the helicopter scenes. They've got the mm. boat scene. They've got the helicopter chasing the boat scene, and mm. like as good as any Bond movie, by the way. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 um, no. No, the helicopter chase scene looks like the Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry helicopter car chase, except with a done with a speedboat. Yeah, it's incredible. So what ends up happening with the character is. Uh, his life is over, or as far as he's concerned. He, he, he blames himself completely. He, he's the one that got his wife killed. There's nothing he can do anymore. He's, he's, he's weak and he's helpless because they've cut his arm off. Uh, he'd kill himself before he'd become a, some clerical clerk all right, uh, in Interpol. So he just decides he's going to drink himself to death and become a bum. I actually think they did a good job in this, and you can maybe say it goes on too long, but that's, it's part of their commitment to his downfall. One of the things I like about it is when he first goes to the bar and he meets the prostitute, who I actually thought would have a bigger part in the movie, because mm-hmm. she's actually a pretty cool character. Yeah, and, and that she actually she recognizes actually, his goodness. No, takes... I thought she was going to be like Linda Haynes in yeah. Rolling Thunder for a second. I thought yeah. she was going to... They like, played against that. They yeah. pushed against that. She was cool. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you're wondering... Is he like Charlie Rain and Rolling Thunder, like where it's like, oh, you no, know, he's going to go to the bad guy's bar and he's going to pretend to get drunk with the prostitute, you know, just to kind of you know, get the lay of the just land. To integrate, and, yeah. yeah, and it just kind of, you know, no, 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 he's, he's a loser. <laughs> no, 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 this is, not a, he, this is not him going undercover. This is him being a fucking loser. Yeah. And he's just getting drunk it's and throwing his Zahuichi, life away. Like yeah. the, and he's just like living in the gutter. Yeah. And eventually his old mentor really kidnaps him from the gutter. And takes him <laughs> way fucking far away to his like secret his, camp, his, his, secret, his ranch, his secret lair. All right, <laughs> somewhere in the forest. This is what I've been really doing. <laughs> yeah. This is what the restaurant pays for. <laughs> and he's like, okay, so enough of your self petting bullshit. Uh, you can't get revenge uh, the way you are. However, we're going to teach you how to fight. We're going to teach you how to do everything you can do. And you're going to get your life back. And enough of this feeling sorry for yourself. And so he, uh, you know, like a proper Kung Fu movie, starts putting him through the paces. And But not, not just a proper Kung Fu movie, but a proper one-arm Kung Fu movie, which yeah. that is its own genre. It's basically based on, it, the, on the Jimmy Wang Yu films. In yeah. fact, that guy who's teaching him... Mm-hmm. There's this one kind of teacher character who's really mm-hmm. almost, he's a non-speaking part. He's yeah, just yeah. some guy who's there. The way he illustrates how to do the moves, oh, the one art moves, and how he keeps his eye on uh, Ramon Ortega. Yeah. He, the, he keeps his eyes on him, but he shows him as he's doing it. And he's showing the audience in those scenes. And I've... You really Ra- I've rarely, I've rarely been instructed so well in how these moves would be done. Yeah, it's, it's really, I have to in say, I've... Se- Talk about scenes I've seen many times before. Yeah, all yeah. Right. I know you've got shot yourself. Yeah, yeah. Guy <laughs> going through a training, all right, uh, is one of the scenes I've seen the most of any scene in my life. Uh, I've never seen it. You, you were right to point that out because in the movie, the, uh, the teacher who's hiding one arm behind his back, he'll go and he'll fight a guy and he'll block him and he'll, and he'll land the blows. Shows him how he can win yeah. with one arm. So I don't he, need one arm. I, don't need, I only need one arm. Yeah. And so he does it at full speed. And then after he's done, then he shows the impact points. You see, this is how I did it. Here, here, yeah. and here. So how did I do it? I did it this way, this way, and this way. And then way. you can track later on in the movie how he's fighting Absolutely, with, the, with yeah. that one arm technique. Now, one of the things that was actually kind of interesting uh, in following uh, Hong Kong films going into the later 80s. They started moving away from martial art, primarily films, into the more John Woo, Chow Yun Fat, uh, you know, gun movies. Yeah. So now, for two seconds, they were starting to call that genre gun fu. <laughs> but then the guys, uh, Toby Russell, Ken Russell's son, and Rick Baker, not the makeup effects guy, but the Hong Kong martial art experts out of Britain, started a magazine called uh, Eastern Heroes, and they dubbed that genre heroic bloodshed. And so it started becoming known as heroic bloodshed. However, the way they teach it in one arm Executioner, I think you can officially call it gun (laughs) foo. Because it's all the acrobatics and stuff that you are known to seeing in in martial art movies, but just added with a gun. (laughs) And so he's doing leaps and, and, and somersaults and this and that. And he can fire at the slightest sound. Yeah. And and hit his target. And I gotta say. Not expecting this. That training sequence was as much fun as any 
training sequence I'd ever seen. It was just, it was just such a blast. Tight. And it's so well shot. And the more fantastical his training gets and the more he pulls it off, the more exciting it is. Because you can't wait to see him take on everybody. Yeah, and you feel a kind of crescendo towards the conflict with the yeah. villain coming. Uh, yeah. You know, throughout that scene. other As opposed to just being a whole mm. bunch of moments strung together. But when he actually just does a backward flip, all right, and then like in the middle of the flip, he hits two targets with his gun. Oh, I was... I was Jumping out of the chair, yeah. all right? That was so exciting. Like, oh and my now God. you're ready. Yeah, yeah, now you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> but you, know, but one of the things that's really nice about the movie is it knows what it is, but it actually takes Franco Guerrero seriously and it takes or, uh, Detective Ortega seriously or Inspector Ortega seriously because there's that moment when Ortega is finally starting to like commit to the training and he's finally starting to you know, shake off his self-pity and shake off his guilt a little bit. And then this mentor shows up. Ah, so you decided to join the living again, I see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we've, we we felt that and we're happy for him that he's like, you know, he's, he's, he's crawled out of the, he's crawled out of the gutter. And then mayhem ensues. Yes. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, so basically all these different story points or the story points you expect to find in a revenge matic and it, it hits them all perfectly. And not only does it hit them all perfectly, it all it adds its own little special shine. Now one of the last things before I get to the to the third act is the movie has is has two jumping off points. It's definitely jumping off from the Jimmy Wang Yu films. So uh first his first films with uh Shang Shei, which is the one armed swordsman and then his own directed movies, uh the one armed boxer and master of the flying guillotine. But it's also obviously has seen Rolling Thunder. Well, it has to have. Yeah, exactly. And frankly, I think part of the seriousness of the movie comes from the Rolling Thunder. Which is almost overly serious by comparison. This movie almost yeah. finds a kind of, frankly, Hollywood balance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there is this Rolling Thunder quality, especially to the masker scene, yeah. for sure. The masker scene. But also to him in the hospital bed and to learning how to... Uh, uh, reload his gun with one arm, you yeah, know, which, uh, which was a good little trick they was, figured out. It's really cool, and I especially like how he kind of cocks it with one. Oh hand, no, like, that's Tch -tch -tch. awesome! That's terrific. Now, here's the thing about the third act: it turns into a Werner Herzog movie. Yes, it does a little bit. Okay. <laughs> While I was watching the movie, I was thinking this is where the film is having a misstep because it it it's 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 kind of hit all of its bases just perfectly, and then it gets now it should be bringing the whole baby home when it comes to like assaulting the main bad guy's lair, his where, island or his lair or whatever it is. All right. Uh, the, the assault of the fortress. Uh, okay. Now you bring it home, you wipe out all those guys and you kill the guy. Okay. Now this is the part when the movie starts getting a little windy and starts whatever. But then now having seen the film all the way through Yes, it does get a little windy, but it seems to be kind of going on its own and it knows what it's doing. Yeah. Uh, so because it starts following the big guy who killed his wife, Jason, and then Edwards as they try to escape through this jungle. Yeah. And, okay, you just said it. Yeah. He's... It's, it's as if they hired Werner Herzog <laughs> to, shoot. to shoot second unit. He is a pig, and so therefore he must slog through the mud like a pig. <laughs> and it was like Werner Herzog watched the entire movie up until that part and said, okay, as far as I'm concerned, forget Edwards. I'm making Jason the main guy. It's Jason's story. From here on, Bobby Suarez can deal with the one-arm execution all he wants. I, this is Jason's movie, The Fat Henchman. I am making the movie about the journey of degradation of the fat henchman who's like a pig. And I will put him through the mud like the pig he is. And we will enjoy his degradation. But the degradation that we enjoy is the degradation of us all. That was a little, like, probably more like Michael Curtiz, but, <laughs> but yeah, Werner Herzog. I think the, the sentiment-wise, it was like Herzog. Sentiment-wise, it def definitely was, because he would definitely be like, you know, he he must become stuck in the mud, for the for nature holds on to him and strangulates him and holds him down. <laughs> and then the movie must become held down as well. There's one other moment, which is when, when Nigel, when Edwards, 
gets his final like you know they they it looks blow like a, up the boat but i see and i think you saw no i saw it too. no it's a, it's a, it's a it's a misstep dives to out of the boat it's a misstep all right because uh look i was thinking they should have just wrapped things up but part of the reason they're not wrapping it up is because they have a big action sequence yet to go which is ed was trying to escape on the on the um uh, on the speedboat with the one-armed executioner following him uh, in a helicopter throwing grenades, you know, at him. And finally, it has a situation where he drops a grenade, lands in the boat, Edward goes, oh my God, jumps out, and then the boat blows up. So we watch it. I mean, he jumps up because it's actually happening. He, yeah. The actor actually has to jump out of the boat before yeah. it blows up. All right. That's that's why he does, because it makes sense. <laughs> you don't want to blow up the actor. But the way we're looking at it, no, Edwards is just floating around in the water. All right. He, he, he didn't blow up. It would have been easy enough to cut to the boat just exploding. And we would have assumed you. But we watched him get clear of the boat. And then he even says, OK, let's turn around and get Edwards. Uh, in the in the in the helicopter, but then it ends up he has his final thing with the fat guy Jason, and now I'm expecting him to go get Edwards. But then the music starts playing, and you know that the we're mo- done. Yeah, you know that the movie is working as if Edwards is dead. Well, here I've thought about this, and I was thinking. I mean, I mean, but like, I mean, look, the one I'm executioner even says, "My work here is done." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I think I think that to director Bobby Suarez, philosophically, Edwards isn't really revenge. Mm-hmm. Like he's just a businessman. He's just a guy. He's the facilitator. He's just some white dude like, on the on the island. <laughs> he's just a Mitchum brother. What are we... <laughs> the guy who ran the sword through his wife. Yes. The the pig who like killed his wife, <laughs> and and even up to his death. Is gloating over it. Yeah. In death. How do you feel? Not as good as a felt rubbing that blade through your wife. <laughs> to, you know, to Bobby Suarez, to Bobby Suarez, that's the villain. Yeah. True revenge, you know, is, is taken there. And, and to, to him, that's enough. There will it's, always be a Nigel Edwards in the world in the Philippines. That's okay. the problem. Maybe that's the commentary. Nigel Edwards. That's a good, yeah. that's Nigel Hogg. Did okay. I call it Nigel Edwards? No, I like Nigel Edwards. Right. You're going to write that one down too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, I wish I didn't have a question mark thinking they was going to go back and get Edwards later, but his kind of slow walk, taking a bullet with each, you know, his slow approach to Jason as he just shoots him one by one, you know, gets constantly moving forward on him. That works great. That's well, terrific. There's a commentary going on mm-hmm. about um, American imperialist influences in the Philippines at that time. Mm-hmm. It's almost on display in the background of every shot of the police, which <laughs> yeah. is, which is, are these pictures, mm-hmm. paintings mm-hmm. of Imelda Marcos. Yeah. And all federal buildings. Yeah. Yeah. And so I mean, one, one Painting of her looking at us as if she's almost like a fourth character in the movie. <laughs> Constantly throughout it. I mean, there's there he's definitely making a point yeah. about uh, the corrupt influences that are going on in the Philippines at that time. Mm-hmm. And it, it's almost like Edwards gets away or doesn't get away. It doesn't matter because there's always another Edwards to step into his place. <laughs> that might be the Philippine attitude. Whereas the guy who ran his sword through your wife. <laughs> and guy, laughed. The, and laughed. That guy's gonna die. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. That guy's gonna die. And laughed in a sound designy kind of way. In a creepy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, one armed executioner is a powder keg. It just delivered like dominoes. I'm a big uh, Bobby Suarez fan. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing even more films with uh, with him and Franco Guerrero. I, one I think I have in my collection is one with a, a with, with Christopher Mitchum. Christopher Mitchum, John Philip Law, and Franco Guerrero called uh, American Commandos. And by the way, Edwards is in that one as well. Well, um, I dug up an old review mm-hmm. uh, by, a, actually, a, it seems like a recent review, by my favorite uh, uh, critic, uh, Franklin mm-hmm. Browner. Uh-huh. Uh, I have to read it in the voice of uh, Bill Margold. Bill, Mar- Bill Margold. Bill yes. Margold. <laughs> because you've been reading me all of these uh, Bill Margold and Jim Sheldon reviews. reviews. And uh, you know, you've been sending them to me and you've you've had this project you're working on and you're kind of climbing inside of their heads. I keep hearing his voice. And so when I was reading this review, mm-hmm. I was writing this review, I uh, mm-hmm. I couldn't help but do it in the voice of someone else. Uh, uh, Bill Margold. Bill Margold. One may be unexpectedly lured into believing that this 1981 Revenger is a grade C exploitation quickie. 
but it's truly every bit as good as the best big budget early 80s studio action thriller. But it's only budget that separates the two because all the story mechanisms that make a Hollywood movie a Hollywood movie are here, on full display, with Franco Guerrero taking the place of, say, the virile James Caan, and Bobby A. Suarez taking the reins of, instead, say, Michael Mann. The resulting production is as badass, if not badasser, if there is such a word. <laughs> it is the opinion of this critic that Jodie Kay, as the love-struck Anne, could be cast in either production. She is that wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well, and I can't remember that. She could. She could have been in a Hollywood movie version of this. She could have been in this. No, and she's as great in both. No, I'm, the, I'm, and, I'm remembering actually as we watched the movie, you kept pointing out different Michael Mannisms. Oh, the home. Well, one, the wardrobe feels like it's right out of Miami Vice. Yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah, we're yeah. watching Miami Vice in some ways. And yeah. the locales, yeah, yeah, you know, don't, don't right. hurt that at all. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, it completely helps that illusion. Plus, the movie is. Like, very well, like, very solidly made the way, mm-hmm. you know, constructed the way Michael Mann constructs well, things. Way, I would just say Michael Mann probably has a bigger budget and more <laughs> and, and resources, <laughs> but man, Bobby Suarez delivers. Yeah, well, not only that, I would actually say that, you know, I think the weakest part of Thief is like the the taking the villains. Yeah, which uh, was compound. the same, which was the same year. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but uh, actually, the, you know, the, the taking the villains compound and one armed executioner is fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Which mm-hmm. is, you know, one of the reasons, like, when you look at Thief and you look at this, it's like there are similarities to be, you know, drawn from the two. And and the look of the movie, though, the, the eye of the director, mm-hmm. yeah. as you see. Oh, it's it. right so there. I, I was, you know, I was saying, yeah, Michael Mann. And every now and then I would say Tony Scott. And every, you know, it was like, uh, and there's just like it was know, feeling slick like and that. And there's a cutting style. There's a cutting technique. Well, but look, there's, there's also a commitment to kind of a Hollywood deliver for the audience style. Yeah, no, the, like you're well getting said. you're getting an absolute revenge thriller, but it's there's nothing that isn't like uh, out of the reach of a general audience. That's very very well said. And look, part of look, but the reason we're so enthusiastic about the film is just one of those things where um, I thought I had seen all the great classics of this type of genre, and I knew about this movie. I've known about this movie since the eighties, since seeing the trailer and everything. And I, like I said, I know who Bobby Suarez is. But to actually finally get around, part of the reason we're even doing the show is to get around to watch something like this and actually, oh my God, this is a classic. This is a grade Z exploitation classic. And yeah. it and it's, and it sits right on the shelf with something like Miss 45, mm-hmm. which is probably the closest in its year range. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's, you know, it, it sits on the shelf with Navajo Joe and Coffee and Miss 45 and all, all those really terrific movies. And we just kept looking at each other. Oh wow, we found a you know this yeah. like, or like a Mad Max. It's like or this something isn't like a number three movie. This is a number one movie. Yeah, we, like, it was. This it is was, the main event. No, we were so enthused to you know find a little uh, diamond sitting in a trash can. Yeah. <laughs>